Good morning. Welcome, everyone, to the Atlantic Council. I'm Bart Osterveld. I'm the Seaboard and Gray Fellow here at the Council. I direct our uh, Business and Economics Center. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to welcome back Vice President Valdi Sombrovskis of the EU Commission, as well as our moderator, Dr. Alexis Crow of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, we have a variety of purposes here today, but the main one will be to take stock of uh, Brexit and, and uh, the future, the current state of affairs, the future relationship between the European Union and, and the UK. Uh, and Vice President Dombrovskis will additionally share his views on regulatory cooperation in global financial markets, sustainable finance, and the international role of the Euro. Um, Valdis Dombrovskis, welcome back, has served sin at the Commission as the Commission Vice President for the Euro and Social Dialogue since 2014, with a portfolio that encompasses uh, financial stability, financial services, and the Capital Markets Union. He was Prime Minister of Latvia between 2009 and 2014, and also served as the country's Minister of Finance between 2002 and 2004. Our moderator today is Dr. Alexis Crow. Alexis established and leads the geopolitical investment practice at PricewaterhouseCoopers and is also um, a fellow here at the Atlantic Council. Uh, the discussion is part of our Eurogrowth initiative, with, uh, which uh, aims to foster a robust transatlantic dialogue about Europe and its importance um, to the US. Uh, the event is, not only are we on the record today, we're on TV, uh, so for, for your awareness. Um, and with that, uh, Vice President Obrovskis, if I could ask you to come to the stage. Vice President, it's an honor to have you here today with us. I know many of us in the room are, are here because of a unity that we share uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so it's really a pleasure to have someone here who's worked so avidly for this throughout his career. Uh, so the first question I think today, as Bart also addressed, is this mini-series, this tragic comedy that, to which we're all binge-watching. Um, I think it could be called October is the New Black. Um, <laughs> and this would be Brexit. Uh, so we've just had the summit uh, with EU ministers. Where do we stand today? Well, uh, good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Atlantic Council for this uh, invitation and for this opportunity to uh, share uh, views on uh, latest uh, developments in Europe and in transatlantic relations. Uh, well, indeed, uh, uh, Brexit is uh, one of the issues which uh, uh, keeps us uh, uh, busy. So what was uh, happening in this week's uh, EU summit, I think that uh, good news is that uh, EU leaders, including uh, Theresa May, managed to avoid the most destructive uh, scenario, which would have been no deal Brexit. And uh, currently, uh, UK basically has half, an, uh, half a year more uh, to uh, reflect uh, and to work on what is really their preferred scenario vis-a-vis -vis relations vis-a-vis uh, 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 EU. Uh, because we know that the debates in uh, uh, British Parliament had been um, uh, very complicated. There has been no majority for deal, no majority for no deal, uh, no majority for no Brexit, uh, 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 withdrawing Article uh, 50, uh, no majority for customs union, no majority for Norway, Norway model. So uh, apparently uh, more time is needed uh, to figure out, for the UK to figure out, so what do they actually uh, want and where they can find a majority. So do we still have the range of possibilities on the table then for the UK? Well, that's uh, exactly the uh, point, that still nothing is excluded from no deal to no Brexit. But uh, uh, having uh, more uh, time uh, provides, uh, I think, improves the chances of uh, arriving at orderly solution of this uh, situation. Uh, of course, this uh, uh, longer extension means that the uh, UK will have to participate in European Parliament uh, elections and they are correspondingly already uh, preparing for this. So we can expect also a uh, active public debate on uh, UK's relations with the EU in a context of European Parliament elections. So we've had very stark warnings from anyone from Mark Carney, the Governor of the Bank of England, to Mario Draghi, the ECB, on the risks of a no-deal Brexit not only to the UK but across the Eurozone economies. Uh, the Bertelsmann Foundation came out with a study saying that it could cost up to 40 billion euros annually of losses to Eurozone countries. Um, 
it, where do we stand in terms of actually looking at the future of a financial trading center? Are other European capitals very well poised? We have Frankfurt, of course, a lot of the clearing moving to Frankfurt. Are they well poised to be able to take some of the activity across the branches of financial services? Uh, well, I would say we have two, um, uh, 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 two parts of response to this question because uh, one uh, question is what happens in case of no deal scenario and a uh, second question is what happens if there is an orderly withdrawal with a deal. So uh, in a no deal uh, scenario, uh, uh, of course, it would have been very uh, disruptive and we had been uh, preparing contingency measures uh, for uh, the case of no deal Brexit. So uh, basically it was, we were working together with uh, UK Treasury Secretary Philip Hammond and we set uh, a working group to, together with uh, Bank of England, European Central Bank, uh, UK Treasury and European Commission to assess risks to the financial stability and uh, to take necessary uh, measures. Uh, for example, on uh, derivatives, uh, 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 clearing, we uh, passed a temporary equivalence uh, uh, determination, uh, so to say, mitigating potential uh, cliffage uh, effects. Uh, well, now this concern is maybe not as uh, immediate, uh, so the question is how our uh, longer term uh, post-Brexit uh, cooperation in area of financial services could look like, and uh, uh, there was um, uh, agreement in, in the withdrawal agreement and political declaration uh, that this could be based on a system of uh, equivalence uh, decisions. Uh, uh, EU is basically running uh, equivalence system is, which is, uh, I would say, most advanced uh, in, in the world, uh, which uh, means that both sides uh, preserve the regulatory autonomy. That's probably what taking back control means. Uh, and uh, both sides uh, take uh, equivalence determinations vis-a-vis -vis each other, but it's of course done sector by sector, law by law. So, uh, and uh, of course it implies that UK uh, regulatory framework and supervisory uh, uh, practices how to stay close to the EU regulatory uh, framework and produce uh, equivalent outcomes uh, because only then we can uh, uh, house this equivalence uh, determinations. Excellent, thank you. Turning to the Eurozone economy, um, we've had obviously a softer outlook published by the IMF, um, and we have a lot of uh, you know, risk triggers on the dashboard of the global economy talking about the future of a global recession, what will cause it. Of course, we have on the external shocks, we have the trade war, the trade skirmishes going on. Um, how, how are you feeling today about trade between the U.S. and the Eurozone and, and the impact on Eurozone mm -hmm. economies? Uh, well, uh, first of all, as regards uh, Eurozone and EU economy, uh, indeed, uh, this uh, year we see some economic slowdown. Uh, but uh, at the same time, it must be said that EU is currently at seventh year of consecutive economic uh, growth. All 28 EU member states are growing. Uh, employment levels are at record high, uh, unemployment is uh, down to pre-crisis uh, levels. So uh, all in all we can say that we are in a, a good uh, part of uh, economic uh, cycle. We are in, uh, currently in good economic times. Then if you look uh, also this in a context of global economic developments, uh, also the latest uh, forecast published by IMF, which uh, uh, forecast econo global uh, economic slowdown this year to some 3.3% and then rebounding uh, next year again maybe in a, a range of 3.5-3.6%. Uh, and similarly we follow this tendency in Europe so we have so slow down uh, this year and are expecting to rebound somewhat uh, next year. So there I would say we are indeed uh, 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 in line with the global uh, tendencies. Uh, then uh, what is the impact of uh, trade tensions on this? This is indeed one of the risk uh, factors. Uh, we had uh, one round, so to say, of um, tariff escalation when the uh, uh, US took unilateral decision of uh, uh, introducing tariffs on steel and aluminium and uh, EU came with a proportionate response, uh, so to say, 
setting additional tariffs on equivalent amount of uh, American uh, uh, goods. Uh, but uh, mm, since then, we managed to uh, uh, avoid further escalation. Uh, there was a, a meeting between uh, President Trump and President of European Commission, uh, Mr. Juncker, where they agreed to stop this escalation and set up a negotiating group, which is currently uh, discussing our uh, future trade relations. And just uh, earlier this week, EU member states agreed on a negotiating mandate for this uh, group. So we hope that uh, we can uh, contain those trade tensions and uh, uh, continue uh, to uh, address uh, the issues which we have through negotiations and continue uh, to work within WTO framework with respect to multilateral rules-based system. Thank you. Um, I think even lurking beneath some of the Eurozone recovery in 2018 and lurking beneath some of these external shocks uh, some of the underlying vulnerabilities in the system, pervasive across advanced economies today, not exclusive to Europe. Uh, these would be flatlining productivity, uh, sclerotic or etiolated wage growth, um, and uh, decline of profitability in the banking system. How are you feeling about each of these three today in the Eurozone and the capacity to be able to improve upon them? Uh, well, uh, indeed, if we look at uh, longer term challenges for uh, European economy, uh, Indeed, uh, they are uh, related to the uh, uh, questions of slow productivity growth. Also, uh, in case of uh, uh, Europe, uh, we are uh, concerned with population aging and how to respond to that. Uh, and uh, 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 there, uh, questions on uh, banking sector profitability, we see more like a cyclical questions. So currently, when uh, 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 both uh, ECB and Fed basically continue uh, accommodative monetary policy, low interest rate uh, policy. Of course, it has effects on bank uh, profitability, but then it's uh, a more uh, cyclical development. But on those uh, longer term uh, tendencies, uh, indeed, uh, we need to address them. So uh, on productivity, it's uh, mainly through uh, investment in research, investment in innovation that we can sustain productivity uh, growth, also through equipping people with the right skills to, uh, uh, wor uh, to, to work and to be successful in a rapidly changing uh, work environment, which we are currently having. Uh, so uh, there's no uh, uh, a coincidence that we uh, set up what we call EU skills agenda to deal exactly with those uh, issues. Uh, and also in uh, 2017, we came with the initiative of uh, what we call European Pillar of uh, Social Rights. And also there, the first uh, principle which we're setting out was concerning skills and uh, education. And on uh, uh, population aging, it's a question on uh, uh, long-term uh, sustainability of our uh, pension, uh, healthcare, uh, long-term care systems and also a question of broad labor market participation, which will be uh, needed, so to say, offset uh, uh, population uh, aging. And there, uh, many member states in the EU have already uh, implemented uh, substantial uh, pensions reform, but we think that more will be uh, needed uh, because the tendency is very uh, clear, and the more timely we uh, react, the more gradual and less destructive this change can be. Excellent. Well, there's one country, I think, in the Eurozone today that unfortunately acts as a bit of a microcosm of these underlying vulnerabilities. It's one that some people don't necessarily want to address head on, and it's Italy. <coughs> We've seen with the change in government an unfortunate, I think, uh, in my view, emulation of this kind of pro-cyclical fiscal expansion mm -hmm. uh, that we've had in the United States. Um, so where do we stand on Italy today and the delicate dance between Frankfurt, Brussels, and Rome? Mm -hmm. uh, well, on uh, Italy, indeed, we have uh, uh, concerns uh, uh, concerning economic and uh, fiscal uh, performance of uh, Italy. Uh, and indeed, when the uh, uh, current government came in uh, office, they presented a, uh, this year's budget with a substantially increased uh, budget uh, deficit. And we had uh, difficult uh, discussions with uh, Italian authorities on their plans to increase budget deficit in a situation where they should be decreasing budget deficit. Mm. And uh, we 
so that uh, also uh, markets reacted negatively. So interest rates in Italy increased, both for sovereign lending and for broader economy. Uh, as a result, uh, uh, confidence indicators uh, went down, uh, this negatively affecting investment, and uh, uh, Italy's economy uh, slowed down uh, very uh, substantially. So if uh, um, uh, at, uh, uh, at the late last year, the, this year's budget was built on assumption of 1% growth, mm -hmm. Just uh, last week, uh, uh, Italy presented its uh, what they call economic and financial document uh, with an underlying forecast of only 0.1% growth. So uh, mm, uh, uh, one can say, okay, there is overall slowdown in uh, uh, EU uh, economy, uh, but still EU economy continued to grow with growth rates uh, well above 1%. Well, we'll be presenting our uh, next uh, uh, figures on this uh, on 7th of May, so I'm not quoting maybe with older figures which may be changing by now. Uh, but uh, mm, uh, uh, so one can say that the damage to the economy uh, uh, is already done. Then uh, in December we managed to reach an agreement with uh, uh, Italian government. They corrected course, they uh, reduced uh, budget deficit quite substantially to be, you know, just <laughs> just within uh, acceptable concerning the EU fiscal rules. Uh, it also uh, helped to calm down markets somewhat, even though uh, interest rates still remain uh, elevated. Uh, and indeed, we expect uh, complicated uh, uh, discussions with Italian authorities also concerning 2020 budget. You mentioned May, so we have the upcoming European Parliament elections. How are you feeling about uh, the elections? I mean, we've seen huge polarization in recent elections, whether it's Brazil, Israel, Turkey, this trend of populism and the rise of the far right in Europe. How are you feeling about the elections? Uh, well, uh, I wouldn't say that we see so much uh, polarization. We rather see some fragmentation, that the political landscape is somewhat uh, fragmenting and uh, uh, a part of uh, traditional strong parties in many uh, European countries. You currently have new parties emerging, so to say, both on the right and left of the uh, political uh, uh, spectrum. So uh, indeed, one can expect that the next European Parliament will be somewhat more fragmented, but we still expect that uh, pro-European uh, political forces will have uh, a substantial majority in next European uh, Parliament. Well, how European Parliament functions, uh, we do not have, you know, like coalition and opposition. So it's uh, uh, more like ad hoc majorities on different uh, uh, issues. But uh, clearly, uh, this fragmentation will mean that pro-European uh, forces will help to cooperate uh, to ensure that there are uh, majorities and that uh, uh, we can uh, effectively uh, take decisions at EU level. Excellent. So thinking about trade, it's, it's rather old downside, but one of the upsides, I think, of America's own uh, interesting behavior on that front is that it's prompted uh, greater European cooperation with trading partners. So very quickly cementing free trade agreements with Japan, Vietnam. Um, and now, we're, as we know in the room, there is no EU-China free trade agreement to date, but you've just wrapped the EU-China summit this year. Mm -hmm. um, how are things looking in relations between Brussels and Beijing? Uh, well, uh, first, uh, as regards uh, EU uh, trade agenda, uh, EU remains uh, open to international trade, and indeed, in uh, last years, we have uh, st striked a number of uh, uh, broad uh, and comprehensive uh, trade agreements. Uh, uh, besides the ones you uh, mentioned, we also have a deal with uh, uh, Canada and uh, Singapore. We have agreement, in principle, with Mexico. Mexico. Uh, negotiations are ongoing with uh, Mercosur, with uh, Australia, with New Zealand, uh, uh, some other jurisdictions. So, in in terms of trade, uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, also this uh, uh, President Trump uh, unilateral trade policy and tendency towards trade uh, conflicts uh, uh, gave additional momentum for other jurisdictions, actually, uh, you know. Uh, to concentrate and to reach those agreements yes. because that uh, clearly was 
more urgent and uh, more uh, needed. Uh, as regards EU-China uh, relations, uh, indeed, uh, just this week, earlier this week, we had EU-China uh, summit, uh, so discussing uh, our uh, cooperation in a number of areas, including, uh, of course, economy and uh, finance, including uh, global challenges like fight against uh, uh, climate change. Well, that said, uh, of course, we also have our uh, issues with uh, uh, China, and when, for example, U.S. is raising uh, uh, issues like um, uh, uh, forced technology transfer, intellectual property rights, uh, uh, industrial subsidies, uh, we have the same concerns. And from that point of view, uh, we feel that it uh, would have been better to address those concerns in a coordinated way between EU and uh, U.S. But Currently, uh, this is not uh, exactly happening. Um, so thinking also about the relationship between China uh, and the European Union, there are, there's not necessarily a great harmony on the responses to the Belt and Road, um, whether it's in Eastern European countries after the European sovereign debt crisis, whether it's Portugal, whether it's Italy. Uh, how is the European Union really approaching the Belt and Road Initiative? Uh, well, uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, worth noting that the European Union remains uh, open to uh, foreign investment, including from uh, China. Uh, but of course, uh, we need to be uh, mm, uh, careful when it concerns uh, strategic uh, sector, strategic uh, technologies. So what we had recently uh, set up in Europe is so-called investment screening uh, mechanism which allows EU member states to uh, uh, screen and, uh, if uh, necessary, uh, stop certain uh, investments in uh, strategic sectors or, or uh, technologies. Uh, uh, it must be said it's not uh, country-specific, it's not aimed uh, uh, against any specific uh, country, but if there are uh, uh, considerations that member states see uh, certain uh, risks, uh, this tool is in uh, member states' hands. Thank you. You mentioned your cooperation with China on sustainable finance. I think it's um, a topic very dear to your heart and to your agenda. Um, I think certainly we're at the turning point in the global economy where in, and amongst investors and companies where there needs to be some sort mm -hmm. of harmonization on what ESG, environmental social governance standards are, um, on what sustainable finance truly is. Uh, describe some of the European Union's efforts on this, please. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, indeed, maybe let's start with a bit uh, broader uh, note that uh, we have reached the uh, Paris Agreement on uh, limiting uh, climate change uh, to well below uh, 2 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, well, 1.5 degrees Celsius is mentioned as uh, a kind of a target, and from the EU side we are uh, uh, determined to uh, fulfill this agreement and lead the way globally in its uh, implementation. Uh, of course, it requires lots of uh, efforts also from uh, public finances. It requires lots of standard setting, uh, technological change, uh, but the scale of investment needed, uh, for example, in Europe we have estimates that we need uh, around 180 billion euros additional annual investment till 2030 to meet our uh, Paris goals, which means that it's uh, beyond the scope of public finances. That's why private finance needs to be involved and needs to play uh, its full role. Uh, correspondingly, in March last year, we uh, presented action plan on sustainable finance, uh, followed by three legislative uh, proposals. And uh, two out of those three proposals are already uh, agreed. Uh, first, as regards uh, disclosures requirements, how sustainability is uh, taken into account. And a second, on uh, low carbon benchmarks. Uh, and we are uh, making uh, progress on a third proposal, which is taxonomy or classification system of uh, uh, sustainable finance uh, activities, basically uh, providing clarity, so to say, what is green, uh, and uh, thus uh, avoiding uh, so-called greenwashing. Yes. So, uh, and uh, we are uh, currently uh, uh, 
launching also international platform to coordinate the work of different uh, jurisdictions in area of uh, sustainable uh, finance. So a number of uh, countries had been uh, open to this uh, initiative, including uh, China, uh, India, uh, Canada, Argentina, to mention a few. Uh, 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 so um, uh, in any case, we think that sustainable finance is rapidly moving from uh, being a niche uh, to being a mainstream. And we indeed see increased demand for green and sustainable uh, investment for uh, uh, both uh, institutional and uh, retail investors. So we need to create conditions that there is also sufficient supply on uh, green financial instruments. Which is, of course, helped when it's linked to performance as well and increasing performance. Exactly. Um, you mentioned innovation, and uh, someone sort of <coughs> comically said that Europe is very good at digital taxation, but not necessarily at growing the digital companies. So <coughs> that's probably not an education question, given the fact that we have some of the, the most stellar technical uh, universities, whether it's in the UK or Switzerland, but also across the Eurozone. What do you see as some of the challenges and the stumbling blocks and ways to overcome this? Uh, well, uh, in, indeed, as regards uh, uh, innovation and uh, broader startups landscape, actually, uh, EU has a very uh, dynamic uh, startups uh, landscape, and in terms of startup creation, we are basically on par with the uh, US. So, where the difference comes in what happens. Uh, uh, two, three, five years down the road, that actually much less of those companies are still active at that uh, stage. And uh, so the challenge seems to be for those companies to scale up. Uh, and uh, in this uh, context, there are two things which are important. One is for them to be able to use full potential of EU internal market. We have EU uh, single market, but too often companies, startups which are scaling up, still are confronted with different sets of requirements in each member state. So we are trying to the extent possible uh, change this, allowing uh, companies to uh, act on a uh, basis of single authorization and or a single uh, license across the whole EU. So uh, another uh, challenge is uh, funding. And that's why there were a number of uh, initiatives in our Capital Markets Union initiative on how to develop capital markets across the EU, but uh, uh, especially how to facilitate uh, 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 venture capital, how to uh, facilitate uh, what we call funding escalator, how to facilitate SMEs growth markets, SME listing, so uh, all those uh, initiatives had uh, recently been uh, either adopted or agreed and uh, thus uh, soon to be implemented. And we hope that with this uh, development of Capital Markets Union will uh, help to address also those scaling up issues. Thank you. Um, so where we sit here in Washington DC, the dollar is still the world's reserve currency. Um, what is the outlook for the euro is becoming uh, growing as a reserve currency around the world? Well, uh, indeed, euro is uh, now the second uh, biggest reserve uh, currency. And in terms of uh, trade, it's actually relatively close to dollar. So uh, uh, in December last year, we launched an initiative on strengthening the international role of the euro. So where we are looking at number of areas how we can make a euro more uh, attractive as a uh, reserve currency, as uh, a transactions currency in international uh, trade. Uh, there are examples that, uh, for example, we are importing only a few percent of our uh, uh, energy from uh, US. At the same time, we are uh, uh, having more than 80 percent of contracts uh, in uh, uh, dollars, yes. and often uh, there's even like uh, uh, in certain sectors, even trade intra eurozone is taking place in dollars. So we're looking what uh, what uh, what are the reasons for that, and how we can uh, address it, and how we can actually have bigger role for euro in those uh, uh, transactions. Uh, we are also looking how to make euro more attractive as uh, a payments currency. So we recently, for example. Uh, 
reduced bank transfer costs for all euro, <coughs> uh, euro transactions in the whole European Union. Uh, we, uh, until uh, recently, had it only for Eurozone, that transactions within Eurozone are uh, priced uh, as uh, cheaply as domestic transactions. So now we are expanding this principle to the whole EU, also for countries outside the uh, Eurozone. Uh, and we are developing a system of instant payments across uh, uh, EU, where uh, basically uh, money can be transferred within uh, seconds uh, 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 pretty much everywhere uh, within the EU. So there are many uh, work streams uh, which we are currently uh, uh, developing uh, concerning the international role of the euro. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, and I must ask, some do say that there's a bit of a geopolitical tit-for-tat happening, uh, that the United States hurts Europe in its jugular vein of economic growth, which is exports, uh, and that Europe can in turn retaliate uh, with taxation of, of American companies. Uh, where do we stand on the taxation? Uh, well, on uh, digital uh, taxation, indeed, uh, those uh, uh, discussions are uh, ongoing. And uh, uh, yesterday we had a, a meeting with uh, Secretary Mnuchin. We also had a chance uh, to touch upon those uh, uh, issues. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, what needs to be acknowledged is that uh, economy is uh, changing. An economy is becoming increasingly digital. At the same time, taxation system is uh, uh, still mainly ge geared towards, uh, so to say, tangible uh, economy. And uh, we need to adjust our taxation uh, system to increasingly digital economy. And this is internationally uh, recognized. There is work ongoing within OECD how to best uh, address uh, uh, this more uh, uh, digital economy. So uh, what we are doing now in the EU is uh, basically uh, trying to facilitate this international agreement. But if we see that international agreement is not uh, materializing, uh, then uh, we came uh, with some uh, proposals on so-called digital tax at the EU level. Because alternatively, what we see uh, that uh, concerning uh, especially direct taxation, uh, member states are uh, basically free to set their taxation. And what we see is that in absence of coordinated global response or coordinated at least European response, uh, member states are uh, taking their own decisions because it's uh, member states' treasuries which are really losing uh, money uh, because on average digital companies pay uh, three times lower effective tax rates than, uh, so to say, classical companies. Mm -hmm. uh, and we risk fragmentation of our uh, single market if we do not act at European level and member states start acting indi individually, uh, we may end up with a very fragmented uh, system. So. Uh, to uh, sum up, our preferred scenario would be a global, internationally coordinated solution. If it's arriving, excellent. We are willing to facilitate this and then stick with that. Uh, if it's uh, proving evasive, second best is to have a European solution. And if, if we o even wouldn't have that, then we would have very fragmented national solutions and it would not help also those international companies, uh, multinationals, uh, which are doing business in Europe, because then they would be confronted with different tax requirements in each member state. Thank you so much. Um, we will open to uh, questions from the audience. Uh, so may I please ask you just to identify yourself? Yes, gentlemen here. Uh, your role is at my extreme. I think there's a microphone coming. Uh, Neil Rowland, MLEX News. Two questions, please. With regard to derivative clearing houses in London, U.S. policymakers are frustrated that the new EU law, not yet implemented, uh, would extend oversight to U.S. clearing houses uh, despite a 2016 U.S. EU agreement, equivalence agreement. Your thoughts, please. Second question. Agreements on sustainable finance internationally, of course, you mentioned a number of countries. The U.S. is not one of them. Uh, thoughts about the U.S. isolationism on ESG and sustainable finance, please. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. Uh, 
Uh, well, on uh, first uh, uh, question, indeed, we have uh, recently uh, uh, adopted uh, changes to uh, 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 supervision of uh, central uh, uh, counterparties and amendments to the European market infrastructure regulation. And indeed, we had uh, also discussions on what are the potential implications uh, with the uh, US. Uh, but uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, we were in close uh, dialogue in, in on this specific issue with uh, CFTC, with uh, Chairman Giancarlo. And uh, following the adoption of our uh, legislation, we even issued a joint uh, statement, myself together with uh, Chairman Giancarlo, uh, uh, reflecting how this will affect our relations and how we will continue to rely on the systems of equivalence or as it's called in US on uh, deference. So uh, I think we are approaching it in a uh, coordinated and cooperative uh, manner uh, because it's uh, uh, clear that uh, finance is uh, global and we need globally coordinated response. And as in a sense with the changes of our uh, uh, legislation, we are making our system, in a sense, more similar to the U.S. Uh, uh, system. Uh, then uh, to the uh, second question on uh, sustainable uh, finance. Indeed, uh, currently we do not uh, see much engagement from uh, U.S. Uh, uh, federal government, but at the same time we see uh, lots of uh, interest from states, from cities, from private uh, sector. Uh, two days ago, I was in uh, New York where I was meeting uh, Mike uh, Bloomberg, who is, uh, so to say, mobilizing uh, private sector and, uh, and cities and states uh, towards green and sustainable finance. So we see lots of activity actually from uh, US. Uh, and uh, we believe that evidence of climate change is uh, piling up, and at some stage, also, US federal government will have to reconsider their position on this. You also mentioned at the Economic Club of New York the GDP of Miami potentially slipping um, and looking at some exactly. of the way in which mm. GDP in the U.S. is very closely tied to some of the coastal cities, uh, which are highly vulnerable. Um, I think also in the, in the American sense, when you have the world's largest asset manager talk about the risk to their clients' portfolios mm -hmm. from climate change, hopefully things start to wake up. Uh, another question, yes. Mike's coming just here. Hello, Barbara Matthews. I'm a fellow here at the Council as well, and I'm, I ask a question about Brexit. So you talked about the international role of the Euro and the work that you're doing to improve that. Um, one challenge for Brexit is that the vast majority of financial instruments denominated in Euro trade in London. Um, regardless of how the entire Brexit situation comes out, I would imagine that strategically you would want more of the Euro-denominated trading to occur in the Euro area. Are you thinking about this? If you are, um, can you provide some insight into what direction you might take? It obviously can't be resolved by October, but I imagine you could put things in place that would put you on a different road. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we are not uh, setting some kind of uh, location uh, requirements for uh, uh, Euro. Uh, uh, clearing or for uh, derivatives clearing. So what we are doing here, we are uh, addressing potential risks to financial instability, uh, which I uh, outlined uh, uh, already earlier today. Uh, and uh, 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 there will be issues related to the market access for UK uh, companies. Because if, if UK is leaving the European Union, leaving the single market, uh, it will have, UK companies will have no automatic access to EU uh, market. So it can be addressed uh, either through the system of uh, equivalence, which I described uh, earlier, uh, or uh, companies how to establish sufficient presence in uh, uh, EU. Uh, in this case, uh, I emphasize EU because we talk about EU single market, not necessarily in uh, Eurozone. Uh, uh, and then uh, being able to maintain their EU passports and correspondingly provide services to EU uh, 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 customers. So that's uh, the way how we are uh, approaching this. Thank you. Uh, gentleman here in the blue shirt, you have a mic here. 
Good morning, uh, Dennis Butners, uh, fellow with the Veterans and Global Leadership. Hong Kong's Leipne Lodzam was Washington DC. With that, uh, we've talked about the challenges facing the Eurozone with the US, with the global economy, as well as the challenges with Brexit. You've certainly had your experiences helping to lead Latvia through its financial crisis in 2008. If I may ask, what guiding principles and lessons learned have prepared you to deal with these future challenges? What lessons in the scar tissue have remained from that time? Okay. Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, I would say the lessons uh, learned, they were actually uh, uh, manifold. Uh, but uh, there were, uh, I would say one lesson was uh, during the crisis, that uh, when you are in a deep financial and economical crisis, that as uh, Latvia was in uh, 2008 to 2010, uh, it's uh, important actually to act uh, swiftly to address financial instability uh, because uh, financial stability is precondition for economic growth. So if you delay uh, action, you delay uh, financial stability and with, with this you are not uh, able to return to the economic growth. And we have seen uh, other examples in uh, EU, for example in Greece where they were trying to delay, for example, fiscal adjustment uh, on Keynesian grounds saying that uh, uh, doing uh, fiscal adjustment during the crisis is further hurting the economy, which is, uh, by the way, true. Uh, but the point is that mm, by delaying this fiscal adjustment, uh, uh, Greece was not able to return to financial stability, and by this it made a uh, crisis longer and deeper, and eventually ended up doing more fiscal adjustments than uh, uh, Latvia did, for example. So this is one uh, important uh, uh, lesson that uh, it's important to restore quickly financial stability because with this it's uh, possible uh, quickly to return to the economic growth. And actually in case of Latvia already in a third quarter of 2010 we started to have year-on-year uh, -year growth again. And a second uh, a question is uh, of course it's better not to get in that kind of uh, uh, crisis uh, and therefore, it's uh, important to stick with uh, responsible fiscal and macroeconomic policies. And it's especially true for countries inside Eurozone, because countries inside Eurozone do not have option to devaluate their currency uh, to regain uh, competitiveness. And by the way, uh, uh, especially among smaller EU economies, uh, this is uh, less effective because uh, smaller economies, including like Latvia, uh, they tend to be uh, very open economies with uh, a substantial share of external trade uh, in a, a GDP and as such uh, you lose any competitiveness gains through devaluation very quickly through imported inflation. So uh, uh, therefore, uh, as I said, it's important to stick with responsible fiscal and macroeconomic policies. And this was one of the lessons learned also at the European level. And that's why one of the response uh, from the crisis was introduction of European semester, which is uh, 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 coordination of fiscal and macroeconomic policies uh, in uh, member states at uh, uh, EU level. Uh, I will give you one example, it's may maybe not a very scientific example, I know I'm talking with researchers uh, here also, uh, but uh, so late last year we had discussions with uh, Italy, uh, which had been uh, planning a budget deficit of 2.4% of GDP, and the whole world was up in arms, how comes uh, they are planning 2.4% uh, uh, deficit? and uh, everyone knew it's inappropriate and uh, it was a big issue. Uh, I looked at uh, Italy's budget deficits uh, 10 years before the crisis. Only in one year, deficit was below 2.4% of GDP and uh, nobody was really uh, worried about this. So it means that uh, at European level, now we are actually much more aware and much more preventive against buildup of uh, potential imbalances. Thank you. Another question here, front row. Uh, hello, I'm Roxana Allen from Johns Hopkins University. 
Uh, my question is on, uh, and if you can uh, address the policy on a single cybersecurity market and then uh, agency that is overseeing uh, this policy. And second, uh, if you can address how um, uh, private data privacy is implemented within the EU. Thank you. Uh, okay. Well, uh, uh, first of all, uh, we uh, do not speak about a single <coughs> cyber security market, rather the initiative which we are currently pursuing is digital single market. So, and indeed, uh, we are uh, uh, trying to create this uh, uh, digital single market uh, with a number of uh, initiatives. One uh, initiative was um, a directive on a movement of non-personal data. So basically, we are uh, introducing uh, something what um, uh, some people even call a fifth freedom within EU single market. We have four freedoms, which is free movement of uh, goods, services, capital, and labor. Now we are adding free movement of data. So the data can uh, uh, move freely within the EU. And in parallel, we introduced uh, uh, general uh, data protection regulation, setting joint principles of uh, mm, uh, dealing with uh, personal data, where the general approach is that uh, 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 people should have control on how their personal data is being uh, used. Uh, this data should be portable, so uh, the aim is to give uh, uh, more say and more information to individuals how their data is being used and to use the same set of principles across the EU. Uh, then we are approaching uh, other uh, issues, for example, practices like uh, geo-blocking, making some content available in some member states, not available in others. Uh, we think that this has no place in a uh, single market, and there were some initiatives to remove uh, this geo-blocking. Uh, as regards specifically uh, cybersecurity, uh, we are uh, uh, coordinating this work of uh, uh, member states. We currently do not have like a single EU agency dealing with cybersecurity uh, issues, but there are a number of uh, uh, institutions which uh, work in close coordination with uh, member states. Uh, 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 for example, in financial uh, sector, in uh, financial sector systems, uh, one thing which we are trying to avoid is uh, uh, proliferation of uh, different uh, testing requirements, because one thing in the fin financial sector that uh, all the IT systems which are being set, they need to be tested vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, cyber threats. Uh, and uh, then it may well often be that for financial institutions I working cross borders, they are receiving different testing requirements from different member states. So there we would try to have a once again coordinated streamlined approach across the EU uh, concerning those uh, cyber security testing requirements and also ensuring exchange of uh, information of cyber attacks, cyber incidents, so that there is a faster learning and uh, uh, faster possibilities to react on uh, potential uh, cyber inc uh, incidents. Thank you. It's an excellent question. The five freedoms are somewhat aligned with China's five happiness. Uh, gentlemen here in the Navy Blazer. Hi, Michael Higgins. I'd like to get back to Brexit for a minute. So the EU has now given Britain another six months uh, really su surprised me with that decision. Do, does the EU, do you see a roadmap uh, th through Parliament during this six month period? Do you, do, you, do you have high hopes that they'll actually get to an agreement? Or are you looking for them to decide for another vote or, or just what? Uh, what led to the decision to give them six more months? Uh, first on uh, this um, uh, extension. Uh, uh, first is uh, the fact that uh, UK requested the extension and extension was uh, uh, granted and uh, even uh, longer than was the initial request of uh, UK. Uh, uh, one thing which is uh, clear in a council conclusions by granting this extension is that EU is not reopening negotiations on withdrawal agreement. 
withdrawal agreement has been uh, uh, agreed, so uh, we are not reopening uh, that. So uh, whether we see some roadmap in UK Parliament, no, but it's not our task to see the roadmap in UK Parliament, it's UK's task to see the roadmap in their Parliament. Uh, and we remain uh, open to different uh, uh, options, of course uh, both sides want to avoid no deal uh, Brexit and that's what extension helped to achieve. Uh, but uh, there are uh, also different uh, forms of uh, cooperation uh, when uh, UK is leaving the EU. There's uh, uh, options discussed, for example, on customs union. There's, there's this so-called Norway model being discussed. There are other uh, options. Uh, so it's uh, not that the uh, current option is the only one on table, but there it's for uh, uh, for uh, UK uh, to decide and uh, to find the way uh, forward and half a year provides for some time to do exactly this. Thank you. The Minister has been very generous with his time. We only have one more question. I'll take it from the very back gentleman there. Is the microphone coming? Thank you. I'm uh, Michael Edwards from the European Network of Credit Unions and World Council of Credit Unions. And uh, my question is, uh, when do you expect the compromise on the amendments to the Capital Requirements Directive to be finalized formally? Thank you. Uh, well, uh, as regards uh, amendments to the Capital Requirements uh, Directive and uh, uh, regulation, what we call CRR, CRD, uh, actually uh, they had been already agreed uh, last uh, December and now we are just going through this uh, formal uh, uh, process. So uh, from that point of view I cannot give you the specific date but it's uh, uh, shortly uh, uh, because uh, I would say the deal is already done and we are just finalizing formal procedures in uh, Council and uh, European uh, Parliament so I don't know exactly uh, at which stage we are currently uh, are, but it's rather a matter of uh, weeks, uh, not months. So, um, uh, but of course, uh, 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 work is not finished with adoption of uh, current banking package. So what this banking package did, it basically uh, introduced internationally agreed standards in EU uh, legislation, including agreements reached in Basel Committee, uh, but, uh, in between, uh, there is a, a new set of agreements in Basel Committee, so-called finalization of Basel III, and currently we have already started the consultations uh, uh, with uh, different uh, uh, stakeholders on uh, how to implement finalization of Basel III in EU law. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. Can you all join me uh, in thanking him for his time and, and vision and service?